Okay, so uh, welcome along. It's nice to be here. It's good to have a microphone because actually, I don't know what it is about Tron time, but every time I go to Tron time, I get ill. It's happened twice already this year, right? I went up in January, I got stomach bug, I go this time, I get a cold, bad throat. I don't know what it is about Tron time. Anyway, uh, I'm down here in Oslo and hope to make a, uh, a, a nice recovery before tomorrow. I have to talk for like four hours worth of things, okay? So uh, today, just 50 minutes. All right, so welcome along to the session on uh, Pulse 6, getting beyond uh, static versus dynamic. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm one of the folks who's working on the uh, the, compi the compiler on the uh, virtual machine, MoVM. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's me, okay? That, that was me on the glacier. I like cold places. And uh, as well as doing Perl stuff, I'm actually quite a polyglot, uh, polyglot programmer. Um, a bunch of my other work is in consulting and uh, teaching. Um, and, uh, you know, when I thought back over the last year about languages that I'd uh, actually worked with, uh, I assembled a list of uh, these ones that I've uh, done stuff with and actually delivered code that people use. And uh, I uh, realized I got paid for some of those as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I work with a, a, a reasonable selection, and uh, some of them we might, if, if I put you on the spot and said, is that a static language or a dynamic language, um, you'd probably come to me and sort of uh, say, well, we, we classified them this way, okay? We, we kind of might call these ones dynamic, and we might call uh, those ones over there kind of static. Um, now, of course, there's been plenty of debate over the benefits and the drawbacks in uh, each direction, um, both in uh, the everyday developers building stuff and in the academic world as well. Um, you know, both both positions are represented there. And uh, I have to say that I felt the pleasure and pain of both kinds of language to the degree it even makes sense to talk about them as kinds of language. Um, and my kind of skepticism about uh, being able to, to sort of talk about them as kinds of languages, and I, uh, you know, I'm not really uh, here to sort of talk about what's best so much as um, to talk a bit about how, you know, I like to have my cake and eat it, as the English expression goes. And uh, I think in Pulse 6, we've made a lot of choices that uh, strike quite a good balance between what we can tell you at the point we see your program and look at it and try to uh, to turn it into something we'll run, um, and then we you know we have a bunch of other stuff which you say we well, you know we'll leave that till runtime um, to keep the the flexibility. Let's start out with something simple. It's a bit of C sharp code, okay? So uh, of course to say hello or whatever in C sharp you have to have some boilerplate. Everything has to be in a class, and then everything has to be in a method. But uh, if I feed this program to uh, C Sharp, what do you think it might tell me? A compile time error. Why? Yeah. It tells me this, okay? The word more running does not exist in this context. On one IRC channel I was on, there used to be this very obnoxious bot and uh, sometimes you would say good morning, and it would greet you in response with good more running to you too. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm glad I'm no longer on any channels which have this obnoxious bot. But uh, I think that's a community Andy pattern or something. But uh, anyway, um, what happened here is the C Sharp compiler spotted our mistake and told us at compile time, uh, you know, before the program even ran, uh, even if we would never encounter the code path, you have a spelling mistake here. This could never possibly work. Okay, so this is Python and Ruby, and if you squint, they basically look about the same. Um, and uh, what happens here? It, it, it says opening time, and then you get an error. Yeah, you do. You get this. Okay, opening times, and then we get a traceback uh, in one. Uh, over here, we get a, a wonderfully big hex number, which is uh, extremely helpful uh, for something, I'm sure. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is on the other end of the scale. 
this is at the you know uh, we we try and run until we really 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 can't run and then and then we uh, sort of uh, we uh, we panic. Um, what about Pulse X? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> you 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 think just because I work on the compiler I know what the language does. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it did last week. Yeah, I've I've been teaching the last few days in Trondheim, and you know, having a bad throat. I haven't been. Who knows what's happened since then? Yeah. Any 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 guesses? You get this. Okay. In color. Wow. It comes and it says uh, the variable morning is not declared. By the way, did you mean mor morning? And it tells me where in the code. And in fact, rather than trying to give me a column number, and then I'm just looking at it like, how on earth do I? It actually puts a little eject symbol where you can imagine the compiler was sort of you know flying along through the code like a jet fighter. And then it was like, oh no, syntax error. And it ejected. And that's why we used eject. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Um, so it, you know, it, it not only says sorry for your moronic typo, it's almost Canadian, isn't it? Um, but uh, it, it then um, suggests what you probably meant to type. Okay. Uh, there, will, there will be modules. Um, <laughs> we're, we're still not implementing that one by default. But uh, yeah, we, someone will do that someday, I'm sure. Okay, and it points out where the problem is. So. One of the things we've taken quite a lot of uh, effort on is uh, is trying to actually uh, do error as well. Um, it's a surprisingly hard problem. Uh, actually, um, we, we sort of have a whole bunch of things in our bug queue where you'll see the acronym LTA, which means less than awesome. Okay, which means like we got an error and it really, uh, you know, um, yes, we agree this should have failed, but the failure mode was not constructive and helpful. But the reason we can tell you this at compile time is because we've thought kind of carefully about it and we've decided that you know, certain things are going to be compile time known and certain things are going to be put off. And those variable declarations are one of the things we've chosen uh, to look for at compile time. Um, the uh, you know, various other things we'll get to have been put off until runtime. Um, and then where we have said, well, at compile time you, you know, yeah, we decide these things. Um, we've then put in various sort of escape valves and mechanisms so that you actually can still do a lot of the interesting dynamic stuff um, and still get all the static checking too. And that's uh, that's kind of what I'm going to be uh, focusing in on during this this session. Um, there's there's kind of an irony that by making a very very dynamic language in terms of letting you mutate the language itself, um, we actually make the sorts of things that we can tell you at compile time more valuable. I think there's been a lot of uh, realizations during the development of the Perl 6 language uh, where we have uh, found that there's certain things that work really, really well um, and then applied them very, uh, very deeply. Um, one of them is lexical scoping, um, which sounds kind of fancy, uh, but uh, simply means uh, you know the the region between uh, a a pair of curly braces. Okay, so whenever you see a pair of curly braces in Perl six, uh, we are we're saying, well, that's a uh, a lexical scope. And variable declarations, when you say my, okay, that is belonging to the scope within that set of curly braces, and beyond the end of that, that variable no longer exists. And as we come through and pass it, okay, we see that dollar sum, and we say, okay, there, there's a there's a sum variable now. By the way, what does this program do? Um, it gets a load of values into a array, and then uh, it adds them up. That uh, that square brackets with a plus is uh, we call it a reduction meta operator, uh, which is a fancy way of saying take the plus thing and pretend that I shoved it between all of the things in that array. Um, so. The other thing that we've made lexical uh, by default is subroutines. So you can imagine that sub as, as if it had a little my out the front. So here, 
If I now go and call abbreviate and I spell it wrong, it'll actually come to me at compile time and say, wait a minute, that subroutine doesn't actually exist. We don't know about that. So just by choosing that the resolution okay, of these, uh, these calls to subroutines and the, the definition of them is going to be lexical, we've immediately put that into the set of things that we can decide for you at compile time. And there's actually a bunch of reasons that we've, uh, we've done this. Um, one of the other um, things that will happen, if you, uh, if you, for example, forget one of the arguments, we're going to tell you about that at compile time here as well. Um, so uh, here you can see that, uh, oh, you gave it a string. And uh, actually, we, we kind of expected uh, two things. You can, you can pass anything in as the text and anything in as the, uh, the number of characters to abbreviate to. And going further, if I go and I, and this is optional, but if I go and start putting some type constraints on there, so I say you have to give me a string as the first thing, and you have to give me a, uh, an int as the second thing. In some cases, okay, when we can look at the two things here, particularly in literals, where we look at the two, we can say, wait a minute, this is never going to work either. Um, one of the, you know, the, the things we spot here is, well, um, you passed a, an int and a string, and actually we need a string and an int. One of the reasons we do this kind of analysis, by the way, is that in Perl 6, all of the operators are actually lexical subroutines with funny names. What that means is that in order to sort of take something like the plus operator and efficiently compile it in various cases, we, we really need to know what all of the possible versions of plus we could call. Okay, so adding to uh, integers, adding to rationals, adding to complex numbers. Okay, they, they all do something different. Um, but by making the set of them belong in a particular scope, um, what we've been able to do is, uh, you know, figure out there, okay, um, you know, we, we can sort of pick which one you're going to have as we compile the script. So we get a, a whole bunch of benefits there. Um, you might then be wondering, well, does that make all the dynamic stuff slow? And the answer is no, because then we do another load of work where we watch what you actually use at runtime and replace your code with a faster version of itself. But scoping is only one half of the story. Because it's not just that we only say that a subroutine lives within uh, a particular lexical scope or a variable is declared within a scope. We actually in Perl 6 have this notion of begin time. And that's in Perl uh, 5 as well. And uh, what actually happens with a, a line of code like this is it's sort of torn into two parts, a declaration part and an execution part. The declaration part is that. As soon as we see my dollar sum, we say, oh, there is a variable that is called dollar sum. It lives in this scope. It'll be visible in all of the nested ones. And uh, you know, we know it now exists. And we sort of make a note that every time we run a piece of code that has this line in, uh, when we run the program, we're going to have to have space to store that, uh, that variable. At runtime, that's when we actually come and we make the assignment, and we've already made a slot for it. Okay, so uh, we go ahead and uh, you know we do the the actual operation. Now, this happens for lots and lots and lots of things. Um, so uh, one one historical aside on this, by the way, um, you know I I got involved in working on the uh, the compiler stuff. I guess around two thousand and eight, maybe. Patrick's nodding. He yeah. I think, really? Oh my, that makes it sound a really long time. I think it was, a, I think it was about December, though, or something like that. Okay, okay, so, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I guess I joined, and then I immediately realized, no, it won't be this Christmas, it's too much work. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, um, one, one of the things, I, I teach software architecture uh, courses quite a bit, and I, I always love to put up uh, this graph. I call it the ignorance curve. Um, but uh, whenever you go into a project of any kind, you start out at a point of maximum ignorance. 
Okay, you know nothing uh, about the thing you're building. And over time, hopefully, ignorance decreases. And uh, you know, as you go on, you're in a better uh, place to, to make better decisions. Um, one of the reasons I often teach about this is that um, so often we go into projects uh, and we try and make lots of decisions up front, like which database, uh, you know, which language, which whatever, um, whereas actually things that would serve us better at that stage are spike solutions, throwaway prototypes, and so forth that actually um, let us get some, uh, some better understanding. Um, and uh, of course, going into Pulse 6, I, you know, my thing was like, okay, you know, uh, we're building. I, uh, you know, we're building the thing. Um, and uh, in hindsight, um, you know, really at that point, uh, though we didn't know it, uh, you know, we were we were exploring. Um, and at some point, you know, uh, for me, there was this big aha moment, um, and uh, that happened, uh, you know, a, a year or two in. Um, and I was looking at the stuff we were doing in the code base and seeing all of these repeated, very tortured, very painful things wherever we had this compile time versus runtime distinction or interaction of things. Um, and uh, that led to some fairly deep architectural changes to the way that we uh, actually did things in the compiler. Um, and Really, um, that's where a lot of the the really you know nice things have come from uh, in terms of the you know the object system, the type system, and so forth, and all of these sorts of checks that I'm talking about today. Let's talk about classes. Classes are also declarations, and uh, they also come into being as you compile, and this also provides us with a few opportunities. Now, one of the things that is always late bound, and we don't make any effort to try and catch anything like this as we compile, is method calls. Why is that? Well, if you go back and you look at the original ideas from Alan Kay and object orientation, the late binding was one of the really, really key original things in object orientation. That whole notion of send a message to an object and let it interpret it is really right at the heart. In fact, he has and, you know, more recently said that you know, he regrets calling it object orientation because it made people focus on the objects, not on the messaging, and the messaging was the really big idea here. Um, and uh, actually, ever since I started designing my objects method first, Okay, so I figure out the methods, I start looking at invariants, and I let the classes figure themselves out as I, you know, and I discover the classes. I don't think, what classes shall I have first? Okay, they're, they're down the line. And what, you know, what attributes are they having? Well, forget it. I, I don't even care until I'm probably writing some tests. You know, that, that's way down the line there. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing in OO that's really important is the, the messaging, the late boundness of the messaging. That's, that's the, the thing that gets us the flexibility. So, you know, recognizing that, um, this is the place where we say, well, as soon as we're going towards method calls, okay, or message sense, though we've gone with the method call terminology in Pulse because uh, it's the, the familiar one in our industry. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as we do that, that it, that's very much a late bound thing. So, if you call a method that doesn't exist, okay, so here I have a, an ax class, okay, and uh, if I if I call the description method on there, then you will see that uh, that's a runtime error. How do you know? Because it doesn't say sorry about those. Okay, we're only sorry about compile time errors. Runtime ones, they are stupid full. So I'm 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 only sort of kidding. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, if you're looking at this code and wondering how it works, by the way, um, okay, has is how you declare some storage in that class. Um, and uh, the dot there actually is saying, and please generate an accessor method for me. And also, please automatically make me a magical constructor so when I pass it these name parameters, it sets them all up. Okay, and it saves you all kinds of boring boilerplate there. But uh, if methods are late bound, then in theory, I should be able to take advantage of that, right? Well, yes, I can. So if you write a method called uh, fallback, 
okay? Anytime you see an uppercase name in Pulse X, it's something we call for you uh, in some special situation. Okay, so uh, fallback is uh, the, the thing we call uh, on your class, if you put one there, uh, which handles the case where a method was called and we, uh, we didn't actually uh, you know, find that method. So uh, we try and you know, do something in its place. Now, uh, what we can actually do with this is uh, we get the, the name of the method, okay, which is going to be P or, uh, or A. And that goes into that dollar name. And then uh, over here, this, what's this star and at thing? Well, at, that's an array. The star, it's, it's like slurp, OK? Um, I'm not quite sure uh, how to, to give you a mnemonic for it. Maybe it, like the, you know, the emoticon for a kiss is a colon and a, uh, a star and kissing and slurping are similar, maybe. I don't know. Um, but. Uh, yeah, you won't be able to unthink that in the morning now. That's good. I've taught you something. Um, now, uh, the star percent, okay, uh, is uh, named parameters. Um, so we can actually use this so we can say, well, here's a, a paragraph tag, which is going to have uh, three children. And uh, then it, one of them is this a tag, and it has this attribute. And then we do some really boring rendering, and we make all sorts of uh, terrible things because we're forgetting to encode, but it's a small one-slide example. Um, but that's all the code we have to write to, to make a module like this. Okay, and we just sort of, uh, as soon as we start doing this, we start realizing, well, you know, methods are, and method calls are very much first-class things. We have a whole load of other ways where you can delegate um, a message or a method call off to one of your attributes and say it's its job to handle it. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of other metaprogramming stuff where you can uh, you can do all sorts of uh, interesting things with uh, doing the uh, the special handling of the the method calls. In my session tomorrow, I'll show you a couple of them uh, where we actually use this sort of ability so that you can write a class and we automatically apply locking around all the method calls. Um, so you get monitor semantics. So in summary, we, you know, because of course it's Perl, we think a lot about linguistics and language. We really have this sort of meme of, if it's lexical, then it's about your language. And in the current language you're speaking, okay, and we always know what language we're in, the, the Perl 6 compiler is never, ever, ever confused about what language it's in. Okay, just, just to show you a nasty example of that, um, if I just uh, pull up the, the, uh, the REPL here. So uh, one of the things that we can uh, do in Perl 6 is we can say 1 plus 1 equals, and then I can put a code block in here, and I can uh, actually do a calculation. And uh, there we go. Um, but just to, sh you know, so one of the things you notice is we go from being in Perl 6 to being in a string language, and then in the code block to back to being in Perl 6 again. Um, and you might say, well, you know, what does that really mean? And, uh, you know, um, what I could actually do is I could, uh, you know, do something in here where I, you know, and, uh, you know, we'll take the string uh, mom and we'll uh, uppercase it. And what you'll notice is, notice the, uh, the nesting of the double quotes there, which is never actually going to confuse Perl 6 because it's got a little stack of languages it's in, and it knows that inside of that code block, it's inside of the Perl 6 language again, and inside of that nested string, it's in the string language again, and then it comes out of that, and it's back in Perl 6, and then it comes out of the curly, and it's back in the string language, and then at the end, we back in Perl 6. And uh, we did that with regexes as well, okay? So uh, we never have any sort of confusion um, about exactly what we're passing at any point in time. That's a very deep design principle in the passing. But don't write code like that. Method calls, by contrast, are about the language of the object you're sending the message to. And it's interpreted as, you know, as the object uh, sees fit. Um, so you know, we've, we've made a very distinct boundary there about you know, current language versus the object's language. So what, what does fall inside a class inside current language? What do you think this one will do? Do you spot it? <laughs> hmm? 
It's a compile time error. Yes, it's sorry about it. It's a compile time error. Okay, it says, oh look, this attribute uh, is not declared in the uh, the class war. And uh, with no suggestion, I'm compiler, I am disappointed. Um, so uh, huh, maybe someone can patch that. Uh, but uh, yeah, you'll notice it, it figured that out at compile time. And uh, you know, how about this one? What have I got wrong this time? It's right near the end in, in two senses. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've missed off the, we call it a twiddle, the exclamation mark. The, uh, the thing in it says, uh, you know, this is a, a private to this class bit of storage. We, we've kind of, you, you know how Perl sort of has always stolen everything from everywhere? And then mixed it together, but you know, in a tasty way. Um, well, in uh, in Ruby, they they kind of uh, use the you know, the sigils for something about scoping. And in Perl 6, we're like, that's kind of a cool idea, but we really want them for sort of the structural type. Um, oh, we could actually have both. Okay. Uh, so anytime you see a twiddle, that is, say that an exclamation mark there. Okay. And the dot you saw earlier, and there's a few more of them. It means this is a variable with a very interesting scope. Okay, and uh, as soon as you see that, that's that's uh, what you know it means. But yeah, um, this one we we also catch. This time we actually do look and say, oh look, there's an attribute you probably meant to put that uh, that call that uh, exclamation mark in there. So these attributes, these bits of storage, because they exist just inside this class. Okay, we very strongly encapsulate uh, in Perl six. Um, then uh, you know there you have the. Uh, that, that again is going back to the original definition of object orientation, okay, where we have these very autonomous objects, um, and uh, you know we're not supposed to care what's inside, um, and uh, yeah, we make it kind of harder to 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 reach in. Um, you have to write something re sufficiently scary to be able to do that. Private methods are the same, okay. We uh, we don't make them virtual, and therefore. If you uh, you do that one, okay, we'll actually tell you about that one at compile time too. So that's another place where we've said, well, you know, okay, private things in a class, um, they only are visible inside of the class. So therefore, uh, we'll you know try and catch all the things we can as we uh, as we compile. Final one on objects um, roles. One of the traditional problems with uh, using inheritance is if you do single inheritance, it's easy to understand what it's doing, but it's kind of not very flexible. Um, if you do multiple inheritance, then you, uh, you, know, you have a lot more flexibility, but then you start getting into various issues where you, know, you change something somewhere, and it now be that method is the one that gets called, and uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit fragile. Um, so roles give us a way of basically factoring out things that we want to reuse, uh, methods, maybe some state uh, to go with them. And then we can compose them into the class. And the semantic is as if you had written the code inside of the class itself. Okay, so it's almost, it's not implemented like this really, but you can almost see it as the compiler doing a copy paste. Okay, and uh, what we, uh, we actually have here is uh, you know, a borrowable role. Uh, we have a collectible role, okay? So uh, this uh, book is collectible because it's either a first edition or uh, uh, maybe it's uh, also in fine condition or not. And uh, up there we have a borrowable thing so uh, we can take it for a certain duration and we have a cost to borrow the thing. And here we have an old book for rent, okay? Now, uh, some way down the line, we get tired of the people borrowing our books and keeping them too long. So we say, you know, if somebody borrows a book for too long, we will find them. Okay, and then we add a field here, an attribute here, for an accessor saying uh, this is uh, how much we will find them. Now, if I'd done this and I'd gone with multiple inheritance, we normally end up with a left side wins. But uh, with roles, you get this. Okay, it says that attribute. Uh, is in conflict. I've chopped a bit of the error off because it didn't fill on the slide, but it tells you that attribute is in conflict between a couple of roles um, and uh, you actually get a chance to, to do something about that. 
So what we've tried to really do with the objects there is balance up telling you a load of things that you know, are almost certainly mistakes or dangerous problems uh, as we compile, but also leaving you the full flexibility of doing dynamic method dispatch at runtime. Let's talk a bit about modules. Using a module is also a declaration. This is a compile time thing. So when I do a use statement here, okay, and I use these two, they're loaded immediately at the point the compiler sees the use statement. Okay, so I hit the semicolon, it goes off, it finds the module, it loads it. Okay, before we pass any more of the program. Now, imports in Perl 6 are also lexical by default. Why does that matter? Well, because if we resolve all of our subroutine calls lexically, they kind of have to be, okay? Otherwise, we'd, we'd never actually find any of the things we imported. But what that means is that you can do a use inside of a particular scope. You get the symbols there, but outside of that scope, okay, you don't see them. So uh, if I, one idiom we, we have when people are developing uh, you know, scripts in Perl 6 and they want to have some tests, is we have a way where uh, you can write a sub-main and you can, uh, can make it sort of take some, some arguments. And uh, one pattern that people sometimes use is they write a sub-main which expects to get the string test passed on the command line, and they put some tests in there. And they can just put use test inside of there, and that's the only place that the various testing uh, routines are available. Now, this is actually quite an interesting opportunity. Because when we load a module, that's right at the point it's used. And because it can put stuff into the scope of the thing that's using it, and because we actually let you dynamically decide what to export, we can do things like this. Okay, so this is a, a little module that uh, I wrote, shell as sub, okay, and uh, what I say is I, I want to, to have these shell commands available as subroutines. And uh, there I just say ping and trace root. And I get two subroutines that I can call, okay, with ping and trace root. And uh, that's, the, that's basically the entire module, by the way. Um, so what am I doing? Remember the, the slurp, okay? We slurp all of the commands that the, uh, the user wants to have subroutines for. We go through them. Okay, we get each command. We uh, actually, when you, you uh, have a subroutine, uh, it always has an and sigil on the start. Um, in fact, you can call it with it too. Okay. I'm feeling really creative today. Okay, so uh, I can call that as foo, of course, but I can also call it like that. That's its real name. Okay, and uh, but it's, it'd be really boring to have to write that all the time. Um, but that that is how you talk about it as a thing, okay, as a noun. So uh, I can actually shove that in a in a variable, and uh, okay, well, nice. So yeah, okay. Um, so that is why I'm sticking that ampersand on, okay, and that's the name. And then I just install a subroutine that grabs some args, calls run and uh, passes them along. And uh, I build up a little hash of them, okay? Just mapping the, uh, the names into uh, subroutines that will shell out to that command. And I return the hash, and those are all the symbols that I want to shove into the lexical scope of the thing that uses the module. And uh, we get all of the nice static goodness, okay? So even though we just did a very dynamic module that takes a bunch of things and dynamically shoves together a bunch of subroutines and exports them. If I misuse the thing, okay, I said I want that and I, uh, I write out trace root, it's going to come to me and it's going to do exactly the same error reporting, even though these were dynamically generated at use. Okay, because so we've got a very strong separation here of you know, the begin time and when module loading happens. And yes, you can generate uh, classes there as well. When you write a class in your code, 
what does the Perl 6 compiler do? Um, well, it doesn't really generate that much code. I mean, for your methods, it does. What it actually does is it constructs objects. So it says, oh, a class. I'm going to make an object that represents a class. And then you write a method in there. And of course, there's code in the method, but there's also an object that represents that method. And uh, oh, an attribute. OK, we'll make an attribute object to represent that, and we'll add it to the class. And what you actually have is sort of almost a little document object model um, of the, uh, the source code. Um, now, when we, uh, we want to sound fancy about these, these sorts of objects, we call them meta objects. Okay? And when we want to sound really clever, we say, oh, I'm doing meta programming. But all meta programming really means is I'm working with the objects that describe other objects. Now, because the compiler just makes a bunch of method calls, on these objects, we have a lot of flexibility too. So um, I can make the same method calls myself to dynamically generate classes. So what I might do is, uh, you know, imagine I have a, um, you know, a boring little JSON file like this, okay, and uh, maybe these are just describing some some events that flow around our system. So uh, there you can see we have a, a flight booked event which should have a, you know, these these three properties. <coughs> Sorry, a flight uh, cancelled event, which had to have those two. So I take this, and uh, what I'd like to do is to write a module where when I do a use of it, it goes, it reads that JSON file, it produces all of the classes, and then I can actually just use them as if, you know, someone had boringly handwritten them all in that module. OK, let's have a look at the class, uh, the code to do this. Um, so this is a, a class for method. OK, it takes the name of the class we want to build, and uh, it takes the, uh, the set of things that we're going to store in there. And what I do is I, I go off and I create something called a class how. Now, you might say, what's the how about? Um, well, in uh, Perl 6, we have a, a few different things that you can do with an object, and one of them is you can ask, how are you implemented? What decides how you behave? Uh, and we'll get back an answer that will tell us, you know, what object decides on the behavior. Um, so, uh, you know, if I if I have a, a class A here, okay, and I go off to it and I say, uh, you know, what are you? Okay, and uh, I say, what what is that? It tells me, oh. It's, uh, it's a class. Um, but uh, if I do a role here, OK, and uh, we do the same, it says, oh, it's one of those, OK, and, uh, which, which is quite a mouthful. And uh, I won't go into why. But what we do is we create this object, and uh, we pass along the name of the class we're making. Now, at the end of creating a class, it, you do something called composing it. Um, this is equivalent to when you get to the closing curly brace. OK, and uh, we do a bunch of work checking the class is consistent, pulling in any roles, generating any, uh, anything we need to there as well. Um, and uh, in between, all I'm going to do is loop over the things that I want to store in there, create a new attribute object, OK, and uh, then just uh, call add attribute. And this little dot hat, OK, is sort of saying I'm making a call on the meta object. And we're very careful to separate the levels. This is another one of those things that, uh, you know, as was very strongly said in the small talk, uh, by the small talk folks, um, that you should be very clear when you are doing stuff with an object itself and when you're doing stuff at the meta level. That is, the thing that decides how the object works. And in Perl 6, we, you know, we again have quite strongly uh, distinguished things on the object and things on the the thing describing how the object works. Okay, so uh, once I do that, I have something that makes me these these little classes. I then just need to go and uh, uh, I make a. This time I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm not going to do the hash. Okay, I'm uh, instead going to to just poke things into a package called export default, which is another way of doing this. And uh, I say at begin time, okay, read in the events from the JSON file go over them and uh, make a class for them, okay? And uh, install it 
This hour means put it in the current package, which is export default. Okay, and uh, that's that's all we need to do. Now, don't worry too much about the details, uh, but uh, hopefully you can sort of see the uh, you know what we've done. We've taken a JSON file describing a bunch of things, and we've just turned those into to real classes dynamically. But there's one more thing that makes this kind of cooler as well, and it relies on the begin keyword. You see. What we've actually done is created all of these classes at the point we were compiling this module. Now, in Perl 6, you can compile modules into bytecode, okay, on the JVM into a jar file, uh, on more VM into just a, just a bytecode file there. Um, and when you do that, we actually save all of the objects that the compiler made. What this means is that if suppose I put this module onto the you know the Perl 6 CPAN and I uh, you know I go off and uh, you know uh, one time it reads in this JSON file okay as we compile it um, when I install it every time I use it downstream we never have to read the JSON file again okay um, so this lets us actually do all the dynamic stuff once and sort of cache it which is also pretty powerful. Okay, so for my final trick before we can have lunch. So what I just showed you is how we can make classes dynamically. But uh, if classes and roles and the way they work are described using objects, can I, for example, replace one of those objects or inherit from one of those objects and change how it behaves in some kind of way? Let's take a small example. Imagine that I was building an MVC framework. Okay. Now, what I might decide is that you know, I write this controller class where we inherit from a base class called controller. And every uh, method that is in here okay, should have some kind of URL template. So we know when we go to, for example, slash, um, we should come to this page. When we go to slash you know, about, then uh, we want a different method. Now, one error uh, that people might make in here is they might actually forget to give things URL templates. Okay, and we might sort of say, wouldn't it be nice if we could tell the user of my MVC framework, as they compiled their scripts, what they've done wrong in using the framework? So this isn't just about a language misuse anymore. This is about somebody building libraries for other people to use to build their stuff in Perl 6 and enabling the library builders and the framework builders to also plug into the compile time and be able to do their own sorts of things as well? And the answer is, well, yes, we can do that. Um, and again, um, you know, don't worry too much about the details of the code, but uh, we'll make our controller class. And I'm going to, to make a role called a URL template. And this, if we just go back a slide, you see that is URL template? That's called a trait. And there are ways that you can attach extra bits of information at compile time to basically any kind of, of declaration. So we have these for variables, for classes, for attributes, um, and in this case, for methods. Okay? So what I've said here is that uh, if anyone says is URL template on the method, then I want to take this role and I want to mix it in. Okay, that means just take this method and add add extra storage to it, and uh, make sure that it uh, it says that it does this URL template. That's a, a secondary use of roles in Perl six. So now I've got the method. Okay, and the method has now stashed away the fact it has a URL template and the actual template. And then what I can do is I can in a, in a package called export how, that is export how different types work, okay, and it reminds you of the dot how in uppercase, I can say I want to write a class that supersedes the meaning of the class keyword. Okay, so I want to change what class means in the thing that imports this module. And I'm going to inherit from the default implementation of classes and I'm going to override something. And what will I override? Well, I'll override add method. Okay. So every time we add a method to a class, 
I can do something and then I'll say, provided everything is well, we'll do call same and we'll just go and continue um, doing the, uh, the running. Now, finally in here, all I'll say if is, if myself is a controller class, okay, so only apply this logic to classes and the controllers, and the method does not have a URL template, that is, does not implement that URL template role, then die, okay? And this becomes a compile time error. And uh, the compiler not only spits out your error, it puts the nice sorry above it, and it points out that uh, the problem was there on, uh, on line number six, okay? Um, which does not correspond, yeah, oh yeah, it's six, it's six. Yes, it is, yay. Cool. I, I was like, was I off by one when I made the code smaller to fit on the slide? No, not today. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, you can sort of see that what we've kind of done, you know, we don't expect that the everyday Pulse 6 programmer is going to be going and doing lots and lots of meta programming. Okay. But what we're doing here is we're sort of saying, well, we'll try and help those who build nice libraries and frameworks on top of Pulse 6 deliver a really nice user experience for the developers using their library and framework too. To me, this is, I think, where we'll get some of the, uh, you know, the really good value. A lot of the time, people are drawn to languages uh, by the tools that are available in that language. Um, so, you know, JavaScript didn't seem an attractive server-side language until somebody said, oh, here's an API for doing lots of asynchronous stuff, and look, async is awesome. And then we ended up with loads of people uh, writing stuff in Node.js. Um, when uh, we ended up with uh, you know, the, uh, the ACA, ACTA framework in uh, Java and Scala, that was a big pull factor for people to build distributed systems there. What I really hope is that now as the language is really falling into place, um, we'll start seeing people building really nice libraries and frameworks that take advantage of all these things that we have to offer in Pulse 6, where we can deliver a really good developer experience by letting the, uh, you know, these, these library and framework authors plug in to the compilation framework. Okay, so it's a probably about lunchtime. Let me just uh, round this up. In Perl 6, we try to make tasteful trade-offs between what we figure out as we compile and what we leave until runtime to give you a lot of flexibility. We've tried to put some of the flexibility sort of into well-contained boxes so that uh, you know, it's very apparent when something interesting is going on. But one of the things that surprised me in a way is that you know, as we've made compile time somewhere where you can you know, get in there and do bits of runtime, we've actually made the compile time a lot, lot more powerful. In a sense, by doing one of the most dynamic things imaginable, okay, making the language itself mutable and pluggable and extensible, that very dynamicity is what's actually opening the door to making the static be a lot, lot more valuable. Okay, so that's the, the things I had to tell you. Um, I'm happy to take any questions uh, from anyone who has them. Uh, otherwise, uh, we got... Okay. Is that somebody with a microphone? Okay. Does anyone have anything to ask? Other than, other than can we have lunch now? <laughs> Yes. Hours you made on okay. Abbreviations. Uh huh. Um, would you look up into a dictionary to help non-English native people? <laughs> Or do you just take the subroutine name? Uh, oh, we, we do a Levenstein distance between the symbols that uh, exist and between what you typed. 
and we, we only do it if we see that you type something, it doesn't exist, and then we say what exists, we compute the Levenstein distance between them. And we've done quite a bit of tuning on it so that it knows about sigils and things like that and weights them. Um, when we first put it in, it was great, but it was a bit annoying because it got a lot of false positives. Yeah. And we've done a lot of tuning on that. And these days, the, the prevailing opinion seems to be um, it's more useful than not. Um, and, it, and it helps. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, would, you, would you have a ma majority vote so that you see, oh, we have this many abbreviations spelled correctly and this many spelled one way and spelled another way? Or is it just what has been declared? It's, it's what's been declared. We, we don't try and do anything more clever than that. Um, though people are generally very open to looking at ways we can improve things. So if you, you, know, if, if, if you have some concrete cases for this uh, where you can say, you know, it would have been really great if it had done this and you know, we can look at it. Um, one of the really, there's a really cool story about this, this stuff. It was somebody's first contribution to the Perl 6 compiler. And because the compiler itself is written in a subset of Perl 6, they didn't have to learn any C or anything like that to do it. They could implement the Levenstein thing in Perl 6 code and integrate it into the compiler, um, which means it's actually very open to hack on as well. So, yeah. Very nice. Yep. Yes, uh huh. OK. And one here. I have a question uh, about one of the code samples uh, you had with uh, as subs with that pink trace route thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in the implementation of the um, export thing, there was this pipe at args. What that pipe actually does? Oh, what is that? Yep. Uh -huh. um, so um, suppose that I have a um, sub here, and uh, we're going to greet. So we have greeting name, okay, and we say, okay, and I can call okay, we can do that, okay, and uh if I was to put these um args into an array like that, okay, you can see it's an array with two elements. And if I was to call the subroutine like this, okay, it'll tell me I didn't pass enough things. I only passed two arg uh, one argument, and it needs two. And that's because we don't automatically go flattening out arrays in Perl 6, which means you can write a subroutine that takes two arrays, and it works. Um, now, if I want to say, no, flatten those into the argument list, I do that, and it works. Okay, so it's, it's a flattener. Um, so it's the opposite of the uh, the kiss, okay, the uh, the slurpy, whatever. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any more? Oop. Okay. I'm not seeing anyone else. So uh, okay. Thanks for coming. I hope it's been interesting, and uh, have a good lunch. <laughs>